I'm traveling 40 east towards Little Rock. And a red car just flew past us, almost sideswiped us, made a U-turn on I-40. He was headed east, and he's now driving west on I-40. I'm at mile marker 21 right now. It's the evening of August 7th, 2016. He's preparing to go out on patrol. He says goodnight to his wife. He anticipates long periods of boredom, followed by occasional moments of tension. He did not anticipate that that would be his last night in his house for a while. He would not cross the threshold of his house again for another three or four months. After that, it was rehab. He didn't go back to work for a year. So, welcome. Glad to be here. Uh, Everybody kind of knows the last call usually ends up being the worst. Uh, and that's kind of how that night went. Um, uh, got a, the last call while I was sitting in a Wendy's parking lot, actually. Um, and that was a call of a car going the wrong way. Okay. You get the call. Guys, wrong way, interstate speeds on a two-lane interstate. Right. What's your first thought? What's your first impression? So a lot of times uh, you get that call and it, it quickly gets reversed. You hear, uh, you know, don't worry about it. He's figured out he was going wrong and he's turned around and heading the right direction now. So that's usually what you expect on a call like that. Um, this one, we kept getting another call after another call, um, which means he's continuing towards where I'm at. And, uh, and they were saying that he was about, about to run him off the road. Um, and he was traveling pretty fast. I believe I read that the initial estimates were he was doing 100 miles an hour. Correct. And I assume that's a 65 or 70 mile an hour zone. Right, it's a 70 mile an hour interstate. It's Interstate 40. Right. So you've had calls like this before, but they always resolve. Usually resolved or we, we get them stopped uh, pretty quick. Okay. You've got this call. It's coming at you. Are you moving towards it? Yes, uh, I got on the interstate pretty close to where I was sitting and uh, started heading east on 40 and this guy was coming west in the eastbound lanes. Um, so I started heading towards him, I turned my lights and my sirens on. It's pretty late, you know, um, I see a semi and a car that I remember uh, passing them because uh, I was thinking this guy's got to be getting close. So I got around those two and I began to try to slow down some. And uh, my plan, you know, is surely he'll see my lights and siren and, and slow down or stop. And uh, I wanted to make sure that I was in the middle of the two lane. It's a four lane actually, but two lanes going east, you know. Right. And so I rode right down the middle of the dotted line and on the back of my police car, you know, we have directional lights. And so I had a directional light on telling the people behind me to get off the interstate. So I'm slowing down, trying to slow down. As soon as I started slowing uh, is when I saw his lights the first time. Uh, and you know, you're, used, you're used to seeing lights at night on the interstate. Sure. But eventually they resolved to the other side of the vehicle. Yes, yes, yes. This so, didn't happen. No, I knew it was coming and uh, and I saw him and I'm, I'm hoping in my mind that he's gonna slow down or go over you know get away from us um, there was a little dip in the interstate so I saw the lights for a second and then I couldn't see them anymore and then the second time I saw them, we were right on top of each other and I was still in the middle you know and uh, he was in the left lane coming you know would be on the fast lane what people would call the fast lane um, he makes a right turn or a left turn on his side. He'd make a left turn kind of from the inside lane going towards, and I turned with him, and then I turned. I remember turning back in the last seconds, and uh, I knew we were going to end up hitting. I knew it was fixing to happen, um, and I don't remember. I, it, it knocked me out. Um, now, did you steer into him intentionally? So the way I've always described what happens during this is it's kind of like – when you're in the middle of a play, like I remember playing football in high school, um, everything kind of becomes automatic. And the time that it took for us to see and then react was so fast 
that there's really no thought process through it. It was just a matter of, I'm going to be in this area trying to stop this vehicle. Um, when we make a right, he writes with me, and then we both turn left, and then I don't remember what happened. Was I intentionally there to stop a vehicle? Yes. Um, the thought process through it, like I said, it was automatic. Um, there's no there's no thinking, there was no time to even think about it. And then the actual collision, um, I'm knocked out until somebody comes knocking on my door. This may not be, this might be your end of life. Not your end of life. You're right, you're right. Um, and the best way to explain that to anybody is, uh, any police officer, during a lot of different scenarios, um, it could be taking the call of, um, a domestic dispute and a city police officer has to make that decision to walk up to that driveway and that door and yeah well you know in that case you're increasing your danger well yeah any right. of them driving head on into something doing highway speed is near suicidal well like i said it's a it's a decision that you're going to be there in that chaos and whatever happens is going to happen um just as those other officers i'm telling you about when they make their decision to enter danger, not knowing how bad it could be, even a simple call um, turns out to be just tragic sometimes. And it's just because you're willing to be there. Um, and the thought process is like, a, like I'm telling you, it, it becomes more of a uh, autopilot deal where you're, you're, you're completely amped up and you're trying your best to make a good decision that's gonna be the best decision for everybody. And sometimes that ends the way Mine ends, sometimes it ends with a death, sometimes it ends with everybody going home happy. You know, you just, it's a risk that every one of us take. And I remember a lady just coming up and, you know, she's knocking on the door going, sir, sir. And uh, I woke up to that hearing this lady and uh, <clears throat> wasn't sure where I was for a minute. I felt like I'd had a, a heck of a night's sleep. You know, I didn't, didn't realize I was in my car. Um, so I opened my eyes and I started seeing the chaos. There's fire around my car starting up. There's, uh, There's a fire. In the, the front of my car is, is starting to catch on fire. Um, there's, uh, you know, just destruction everywhere. Yes. Uh, and I, I hear my radio and I go to try to reach for it. And it's off this side, you know, and I'm starting to reach and I can feel just crunching in my body and so I, I stopped obviously didn't want to hurt anything more and um, that's when I started really real, realizing I might die you know um, started to really come to grips with what's happened I could remember then that I was in a crash um, and I knew I, I started to remember a little bit of what had just happened and uh, so I felt like I was taking some of my last breaths uh, they weren't very deep um, later found out that I'd collapsed both of my lungs um, on top of everything else that was broken and um, so I started thinking about that and um, then we start hearing sirens and I started thinking maybe I should just try to breathe a little bit you know just keep focusing on breath so continue to just take some small breaths and then I start seeing you know, what I tell people are my heroes now they they show up uh, the fire department and the EMS and start working on everything to get me to a hospital. So. At that point, did you have a sense of how they felt you were doing? Yeah, um, every one of them will tell you that uh, they, did, they didn't think it was going to be a good outcome for me. Uh, it, it wasn't looking good. Um, the, the fire department was having a hard time getting me out of the car. Uh, because we have cages in there and all those kind of things, they had a, a hard time. They've later uh, trained now to make sure that they can get around those cages because that's something they weren't, you know, experienced at. They never come across that problem. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, they everybody wasn't wasn't real high on what was going to happen there. Um, the fire department. So. Um, Anyway, they, they had tried Jaws of Life. They had tried a lot of different you know, tactics to get me out. And they, they just, every time the Jaws of Life would squeeze, it would crush my foot. So they get to a point where I, I can hear a man behind me and he is just pushing a bar. That's, 
that's where they what they'd come down to to try to get me out. And uh, he finally pushed hard enough, and the whole car popped, and then I felt my foot come loose. And at that point, um, they were able to pull me out of the car. The, the EMS folks had already got my lungs back um, and uh, had got that working a little better. So things started looking better for me, I guess. Uh, and once they pulled me out of the car, that's about the last thing I remember. What were the extent of your injuries? How many bones did you get? Oh, uh, well, I say the major ones would be uh, a wrist, um, uh, my femur broke in half, uh, a lot of my toes broke, my ankle, both ankles, uh, foot, piece of my back, um, ribs. So quite a few different uh, breaks and a lot of surgeries. How many surgeries? Uh, I, the ones I remember, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's probably about three or four that I remember. Um, and there's, I'm sure several that night that I was there and maybe the first day or two that I, I wasn't really aware of what was going on. Okay. Recovery took a year or maybe a little more. It took it, yes, sir. It took a, a good year of um, uh, rehabs and uh, staying at home. Um, started off still in the hospital, uh, going to wound clinics. Um, a lot of stretching at, at home by myself. The first several months at home were spent just in a chair. I couldn't really move. Um, and then once it got to about a year, I'd realized, you know, I was, I felt like I was losing my purpose. You know, that's my, a big part of my life is to be out there, you know, trying to work and, and help and do what I can for, for the public in that job. That job's always just been a calling to me. And I felt like I had lost it there for a while. So, uh, I hated to, to be sitting at home and, and I finally called my doctor and begged him, please, let me get back to work. And uh, I came back as a CID agent, as an investigator. So do you, do you drive a marked car as an investigator? I do now. So uh, back then I was just a, I was just a, an investigator. And I did that for about four years and uh, really enjoyed that time. Um, and I promoted recently back on the interstate as a sergeant. So now I'm back in the same place, doing the same old things, you know, and uh, not as much because I'm too busy doing all the paperwork. That's what the sergeant gets to do, but uh, definitely getting to get out there and, and work with some guys that, that I've worked with before and, and uh, spend some time back on the highway. What do you think you learned about yourself through all this? Uh, well, there's a lot of things, you know. Um, I think anybody that's gone through a near-death type experience, you definitely appreciate life a little bit more than, than I think most people do. A lot of people spend time taking things for granted, and uh, I don't. Um, and I have a hard time saying no to anything. That's why we're here today. You know, uh, it's, it's hard for me to say no. Uh, I always feel like there's purpose out there for you. Um, I feel like in that car when I thought I was going to die, it wasn't quite as scary as I ever imagined death would have been. And I feel like that's because I was serving purpose at that moment. I feel like purpose kind of defeats death. Um, as long as you're out here serving some form of purpose, I think death is, is easy. I think if you spend a long time of your life doing nothing, I feel like that's probably a pretty scary event. But if you're out here serving and you're out here doing what you should be doing in, in life, I think when that time comes, that you'll go easy.